Today on Exploring Scotland's History, we're going to have another look at the Dalmally, Stranmilken and Glenstray area. We're about three miles up into the hills behind Dalmally and we're going to take a look at this beautiful monument first. This monument celebrates Duncan McLaren. I like a commanding view. I think this is the most commanding view we've seen yet. It is absolutely stunning up here. This monument was put up um, by Priscilla, Duncan's wife, in around 1900. It marks the spot where he spent many happy childhood times at his cousin's house. And in fact, as I pan round, you will see the fittings of the cousin's house that he spent this time. It was designed by Sidney Mitchell and Wilson from Edinburgh and was carved by Beveridge. It really has quite a stunning carving of the man's image and the relief on it is... wow. This is the remains of the family longhouse. McLaren was self-taught, apart from two years that he spent in Dalmally School. Duncan was born in Renton and he was the youngest of ten children. Once he had his two years schooling in Dalmally, he headed off to Dunbar to do his apprenticeship. And in 1824, he set up as a merchant in Edinburgh. In 1833, he was a member of the Town Council of Edinburgh. And a few years later, he became the treasurer, only to find that the city or old town of Edinburgh was pretty much skint. He worked hard to extricate Edinburgh from the financial ruin that it was facing. And he also, in this time, started a program for free education for all, irrespective of class, and had on his program 13 schools that he was responsible for pushing the building off. He was also an advocate of the anti-corn laws the Corn Laws had been advancing profits for the landowners and repealing these laws basically allowed that 90% of the farming people could actually find an improvement um, in their wages as such and it was only the top 10 cream of the crop that would maybe lose a wee bit of money. I don't think it would have been a great loss to them. He was voted in as Lord Provost in 1851. He was also the governor of the Harriet Free School Trust. In 1865, he was elected as one of Edinburgh's two members of parliament at Westminster. During that time, he earned the name of member for Scotland. His knowledge of Scotland was so widespread. He also portrayed a very intelligent and conscientious demeanor. In 1848, he married his third wife, Priscilla, from Rochdale, and they had a lot in common. Priscilla was the sister of John Bright, who had really been the forerunner in renouncing these corn laws, so obviously they'd had dealings between them. She had been a suffragette and a prolific member of the anti-slavery movement. It was Priscilla who commissioned this monument. Some of Duncan's children are worth a mention. John McLaren became a mathematician, astronomer and Scottish Liberal politician. Agnes, his daughter, was one of the first female doctors to give medical aid to females in India who couldn't access male doctors because of their customs. His grandson, Ewan Rabagliati, is credited as the first Royal Flying Corps pilot to shoot down an enemy aircraft in the First World War. Duncan is interred in St Cuthbert's graveyard in the shadow of Edinburgh Castle. That's another graveyard for another day. He lives with his three wives Grant, Christina and Priscilla. A full life well lived.
another monument with another rather spectacular view. Account show the monument and construction costs were £237 and 12 shillings. The monument was constructed in 1927 and I'm going to keep moving because it's starting to become a moody fest. The names below the beautifully carved cross are such as McNabb, McInnes and McGregor, which you would expect for this area. The monument is not a commanding view, a view of the Dalmally Bridge. It's the work of Ludwig Picard, who was under the employ of Bredalban at the time. This bridge was constructed in 1781 to assist with the troops and cattle movement. It's part of the military road constructed between Tyndrome and Oban. I'll put some photographs of his other bridge in the area, which was the Bridge of Awe. His bridge at Bridge of Awe was largely disused and was swept away in a storm in 1993. This one obviously is part of the route through Strong Milken towards Dalmally, so it'll be here for years to come. The river is quite stunningly calm today. It's not always. These rocks are pretty cool and it just shows you the erosion and the strength in the water. This is how you skip a spoon. Ha! Throw a brick. <laughs> this may be the old schoolhouse. Records show building plans for school on this site. However, Dalmally Historical Society feel there is not enough evidence to say for sure. It definitely looks like a schoolhouse. The school is mentioned in the first statistical account in the early 1800s as a reputable school drawing pupils from both the area and as far as the East and West Indies. It was discussed that the rural Highland setting produced more virtuous and hardy pupils than their town dwelling counterparts. In winter months the pupil count could reach 100 falling to around 60 in the summer months where the poorer students would be out working the land. The second statistical account mentions the lack of Gaelic scholars and the third, in the 1950s, says the native tongue was in fact dying out. I'm now standing on the Dalmally Bridge and just there is Tom Nacroy, the Hill of the Gallows, and that is the Hanging Tree. Now it's probably not the original Hanging Tree but it still marks the spot. There is actually a rock still in place to put your gibbet. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's not pleasant. Like I say, that is the hanging tree or the doodle tree, and it would have been used by the Campbells for handing out their own justice. Uh, there would have been a hangman paid by the Campbells who would have lived quite close to the tree. I did mention the stone that remains that a gibbet would have been put into. The condemned man was expected to carry his own gibbet, which is a wee bit 
the same hill apparently is where the McGregors would have carried out their justice when they controlled the area. Sometimes the tree would have been used for the actual hanging and as folk would have been hanging about for a while, i.e. left hanging on the gibbet really as a warning to others not to misbehave. Women who received a death penalty for whatever reason were generally drowned in a still piece of water along the river and we have seen plenty of those too. Most of these hanging gibbets and knolls were in a prominent position uh, because they wanted to keep people warned to behave themselves and who was in charge. The feudal right for lairds to execute their own justice called Pit and Gallows was revoked in 1747. It does make you wonder how much control and power the Campbells had in the area when five years later there was a certain court run by Campbells called uh, <coughs> the Appen Murder. But times have changed, apparently we're much more just now. The hill around the gallows was often known as the Hill of Lamentation as generally clans would have met on that hill to discuss issues and misfortunes that had happened to their clan and community. A popular medieval song was Come follow, 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 follow me. Whether shall I follow, 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 whether shall I follow, follow thee. To the gallows, to the gallows, to the gallows, gallows tree. A current inhabitant of Dalmally is worth mentioning as well, Magnus McFarlane Barrow. Magnus was born in Aberdeen and he moved to Dalmally at the age of nine with his family. He had done his schooling and was working in the fish farms when he saw the Bosnian conflict in the early 90s and really felt he had to move and aid these folk. Himself and his brother put out word that they wanted to collect blankets and food and supplies to assist the Bosnians. He filled a jeep in 1992 and headed to the torn country. On their return, the brothers found the shed had been restocked by generous folk and they were heading back to Bosnia. This would result in a sum total of 23 trips to Bosnia taking supplies, taking support and taking aid. Magnus had taken a gap year from the fish farm and he was never to return. He founded the charity Scottish International Relief and in 2002 it became what we know today, Mary's Meals. It works in 19 countries worldwide and simply believes that an act of kindness can give hope and solace to people in some of the most conflicted and violent areas of the world. By the end of 1919, Mary's Meals had fed over 1.5 million children daily in school. Sometimes that was their only meal. In 2010, Magnus was praised as a CNN hero. In April 2015, he was named as one of Time magazine's 100 most influential worldwide people. Magnus has gathered a plethora of honorary degrees and in 2014 received the honour of Human Dignity Award from the Doyle in Ireland, that's the Irish Parliament. The original shed still there and Magnus still uses it as his headquarters. He tries to keep costs down. The shed lets in snow in the winter and it's like a bakehouse in the summer but obviously using something small like that is helping with costs and it means that more people can be fed. He has also published a book. The famous shed sits in Craig Lodge which is a family house of prayer. Originally a hunting lodge, the house is now used for religious retreats, for contemplation, for family time. It may not be everyone's cup of tea, it really centres around a lot of the visions, apparitions and miracles centred around Medjugorje. It has at least a pure intention with its mission.
we discuss St Conan when we visit the Glen Orgy Church. This is the well dedicated to him since it is traditionally believed that he blessed it and has been used by folk since his day right up until living memory. It might be worse for wear now, but in living memory a metal cup hung here for the folk to drink from. In 1987, Dalmali Historical Society unearthed a small cache of coins from the reign of Charles I and Charles II. They are now held at Glenorchy Church. Local myth tells the tale of St Conan drinking by the whale when he was attacked by a wolf. It said he turned to the wolf and made it vanish in the thin air. This is Bruce's seat. It's said to be where the Bruce rested after the Battle of the Pass of Brander, where he had successfully defeated Clan Common supporters, Clan McDougall. We're a little further up the River Orkney now, just at the falls, just behind my shoulder. I have never seen them so calm. There's been so little rain. But as we look at the geology around here, I would maybe suggest that Bruce's seat was formed in the same manner. This is the site of the Dalmally show and it's been running for over 100 years. In the earliest days of the show the highlights would have been the sheepdog cries. It even ran in 1943 in the middle of World War II and all proceeds went to the British Red Cross who were helping the fallen out in the war effort. As the years of the show went on, they began to highlight such breeds as Highland Cattle and Blackface Sheep, one of the most prolific breeders and indeed showers here at the Dalmally Show was David Lyon Fellows. We visited his grave on Return to Innesheel. I'll put a link up now and one at the end. Such was the show's popularity. In the 1980s, Hercules the Bear visited the show. We discussed him when we were on Ben Langus, since that's where he had escaped when he went on the missing list on the youth. I'll tell you a wee secret. The filming crew for Star Wars up in Ben Craven are currently situated in this site. If you enjoyed the video please like subscribe and leave a comment it really helps the channel grow if you would like to join me on my other social media i shall leave links below to facebook instagram the usual suspects until next time thanks for watching